Here's this one. Well, good morning to you all. Welcome to our service. You'll notice Rory's not here, and you've maybe seen in the notices that uh, Rory and family are staying at home today. Uh, not COVID, I can confirm that. Uh, but we're very thankful that Reverend Donald Morrison is here to take our service today. Um, Good morning, it's good to see you all and a very warm welcome and a welcome also to those who are watching from the privacy of their own homes. We don't have to come to any specific location in order to meet with the Lord. We can meet with the Lord wherever we are, in a place of worship or in our own homes. So I trust that the Lord will bless us as we worship him together. In Psalm 9 we read, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I will sing praise to your name. Now, obviously we can't sing out loud, but we can still praise the Lord from the depths of our hearts. And we do that by singing together in Psalm 95 from the Scottish Psalter. And we sing verses 1 to 6, five stanzas. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us every one a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. Let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. And so on down to the end of the verse, Mark 6. O come. Let us sing to the Lord, and we stand to sing.
shall we come before the Lord in prayer. Let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. Ever blessed and eternal God, our Heavenly Father, you who have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God yet in three persons, we come and worship you this day. We come acknowledging that you are the creator of the things that we can see and the things that we cannot. You made these stars uh, that we see shining far out in the deepest parts of the cosmos. You made the myriad of different creatures that we see around us in this beautiful world. And Lord, you not only made, but you sustain by your mighty hand all that you have created. We thank you, O Lord, that we can know you. We know you not simply because of the revelation of creation that speaks to us day by day when we see the surging of the sea, when we see the different seasons passing and now into the onset of autumn as we see the leaves beginning to change color and fall to the ground. But we thank you, Lord, for that special revelation that you have given to us through your word, the Bible, which always points us to the word made flesh, and you came and made his dwelling among us, even your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is his church. This is a denomination of the one worldwide church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the head, he is the founder, and he is the one whom we worship. And if we only knew you, O Lord, as our creator, that would be reason enough to fall upon our knees and worship you. But we know you not just as our creator, but as our recreator, and the one who has come by your Holy Spirit and opened our hearts and taken the scales from our eyes and enabled us to see and behold the Lord Jesus Christ, one of whom Scripture says he alone is altogether lovely. He is perfect, he is pure, without sin, and yet he, the righteous one, was willing to lay down his life on the altar of the cross, that we, the unrighteous, might know the forgiveness of sin and might be brought into a living and loving and eternal relationship with you, having the wonderful privilege of being able to address you as our Father which art in heaven and as our shepherd and of so many other titles and names given to you, revealed to us by your Spirit in the pages of Scripture. We live in difficult times, O Lord, where the, the daily routines of life have been upset by the present pandemic. But Lord, you are still seated upon your throne. You are still working out your eternal purposes as you build your church. And we thank you for the promise given by Jesus, I will build my church, and even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we know that the evil one will do his worst in order to uh, gag your church, in order to stop the preaching of your word, in order to silence the critics of the present evil age in which we live. But, O oh Lord, nothing can thwart your eternal purposes as you build your church and as you gather to yourself a people, young and old, from every walk of life. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the gospel, the gospel that is the power of salvation for all who would believe. And we trust that as your word is read and preached from one time zone to another, this Lord's day, that it will impact upon the hearts of many and bring change to individuals. Many people in other countries who are coming to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and even in countries that are closed to missionaries and are closed, O Lord, to, a, to your word, yet your spirit is ever active because there are no places in the world, there are no go areas for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the growth of your church in Iran and how wonderful it would be if one day it became known as a Christian nation, a nation that would bow not to a false prophet or a false god, but a nation that would bow to you, the one true and living God, and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Saviour of sinners, the only name given 
uh, by which we can be saved. Bless each one of us as we gather here today. Remember us in mercy. Be with this congregation of your people. We thank you for the light of the gospel that has shone here for many, many generations. And we trust that in this wonderful new building that that light will continue to shine in the years and in the generations to come, drawing men and women and boys and girls to come and put their faith and trust in the Lord in Jesus Christ. Be with your servant uh, Rory and with Kashkin. They bless him and we thank you for having brought them here. And we pray, Lord, that they will see souls for their hire and that they will see a mighty movement of your spirit uh, in Fort Rose and in Rosemarkey and in Och and, and all the way along this southern part of the Black Isle. How wonderful, uh, O oh Lord, if uh, the gospel would be a, would be so a, a powerful in its proclamation that people all over Scotland and all over the United Kingdom would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in difficult times, O oh Lord, where if people do not seem to know which way to turn, where even in government people do not know their right hand from their left, where people are wandering around searching for something and not finding it. But Lord, if they would come to the Lord Jesus Christ, they would find the one who promises to sort out our every problem, the one who would give us rest, the one who wants to walk with us and to carry our burdens, the one who alone of all who have ever lived went to the cross of Calvary and there he bore the penalty due to us for our sins. We thank you for Jesus as the great expression and the great outpouring of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Grant us, O Lord, that simple and childlike faith today, and that we would be able to acknowledge Christ, that he did not just die for the world, but he died for us as individuals. So we would be able to say that Jesus is my Savior, he is my Redeemer, he is my Shepherd. Remember any in the congregation who have special needs. Remember those who mourn the passing of loved ones. And may they truly know that comfort that comes only from Jesus. Jesus who can empathize with us in our loss. Jesus who shed tears at the grave of a beloved friend. We be those who are frail and elderly. We be those who are housebound. We be those who are anxious and troubled of heart. Be with those who are in retirement homes or in hospitals. Be with the young people in their studies. Be with any from the congregation who are away at university. And we pray your blessing to be upon them. And despite all that's happening, they would be able to commence their studies. So Lord, close in with us for this short time together. And bless us and be pleased to take away our every sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, boys and girls, I'm sure you, like me, have made many promises over the years, and perhaps, like me, that you have uh, not been able to keep those promises. I can think of many promises that I've made in the past, and unfortunately, I didn't keep them because I forgot to keep them, or because I simply was not able to keep them. But in the Bible, we read of many, many promises that God gives us. And when God makes a promise, He will never break that promise. He will never go back on His word. And I just want to speak briefly this morning of two wonderful promises that God gives to us in the Bible. Recently, I was on a holiday in Lewis, and I was staying in the village that my mother came from, and uh, one day I went down to the beach, and uh, the beach has many stones, like this uh, white stone. And I remembered when I was a boy, my brother and I used to go down to that same beach, and we would throw a piece of wood into the sea, and as the tide was taking it out, we would throw these stones and try and hit that piece of wood. And the sea around the northwest of Scotland and the Hebrides is very, very clear. 
And uh, when a white stone like this on a very lovely sunny day, as we normally get in the Hebrides, uh, that stone hit the water and sank down into the depths of the sea, you could see the sunlight glinting from it until eventually it went deeper and deeper and it disappeared from sight altogether. And in the Bible, God gives us a wonderful promise. He tells us when we come to trust in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, He will take our sins and He will throw them into the very deepest part of the ocean. And I don't know about you, but I know that when I came to trust Jesus, eh, there were people who would like to remind me of things that I had done in the past and things of which I was ashamed. But God gives us a promise that when we come to trust in Jesus, He will take our sins and He will throw them into the very deepest part of the sea and He will never, ever mention them again. I will never remember your sins is the second part of that promise. So next time you are on a beach or by a riverside and you're throwing stones into the water, and I hope you will remember the promises of God. And he will take our sins and cast them behind him into the sea of his forgetfulness. Well, shall we uh, read together in Matthew's Gospel? And our reading is taken from chapter 14. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. And we read from the beginning. At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead, that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. But John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John. But he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and heal their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. A number of those who ate was about five thousand men besides women and children. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. 
But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. When the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. Amen. And the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his word. Our text uh, this uh, morning is uh, taken from the passage headed, Jesus walks on the water, and especially verse 27. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. The Gospels frequently record for us the fact that Jesus was engaged in prayer. We read in Luke 5, he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He preferred to be in lonely places, away from his disciples, away from the crowds, in order that he could commune with his Father in heaven. And again in Luke chapter 6, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And it was after that particular prayer that he chose his disciples. And I'm sure that together with his father, uh, they would have been deciding amongst themselves uh, the identity of the 12 apostles who would uh, begin their ministry after the physical departure of the Lord Jesus Christ and who would uh, be uh, foundational in spreading the gospel in what was then the Roman Empire, which stretched over a vast distance around the Mediterranean. But much of the prayer time of the Lord Jesus Christ was, I'm sure, simply sweet, intimate fellowship with his Father, where speech was totally unnecessary, even superfluous. And the contents of those prayers are not known to us. He did not share them even with his closest disciples, his disciples whom he regarded as his friends, as he told them on the night that he was betrayed. But several of Christ's prayers are recorded for us. Of course, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, the template by which we are to base our own prayers, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, I grew up in London, and the form of the Lord's Prayer I used was probably the form that was used in the Anglican Church. And if I'm in a church today here in Scotland and saying the Lord's Prayer, I always have to hesitate uh, because the version that is so uh, inside of me is somewhat uh, different. I ask for my trespasses to be forgiven as we forgive those who trespass uh, against us. Jesus came primarily to, uh, to found his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of of God. He came to found that kingdom and establish it in the hearts of men and women. And every time a man, woman, or child comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the kingdom is being enlarged. The kingdom is growing. The kingdom is extending. But to enter into that kingdom, we have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. A, a jailer in Philippi many years ago when Paul and Silas were, a, were a chained in the a inner cell of a prison uh, because they had been proclaiming the gospel, because they had, had been accused of creating a riot. Uh, but they were sitting there not saying, woe is me because of the situation that I'm in. They were singing, they were praising God, they were singing hymns. And uh, the jailer, a uh, hard-bitten 
a Roman soldier who was in his retirement, who had probably taken part in many battles during his operational life as a soldier. His heart was moved and he came and he fell on his knees before Paul and Silas and he said, Sirs, what must I do in order to be saved? And the answer was, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the sheer simplicity of the gospel. It's not complicated. We don't have to engage in all sorts of detailed rituals. We don't have to go on some long and arduous pilgrimage, going up a mountainside on our knees to some holy shrine and far, far above the valley bottom. The gospel, the good news, is what we as a church are called to proclaim, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And I wonder, are there any of you gathered here this morning? You know about Jesus, but you don't yet know him in that personal and intimate way as your Savior, as your Lord, and as your friend. In John 11, we read about when Jesus was at the graveside of Lazarus. He prayed, again, a prayer that's recorded for us. He prayed that those assembled would believe that God had sent him and salvation comes from the Lord. We have to believe that Jesus came into this world because God the Father sent him into the world in accordance with that eternal plan that Father, Son and Holy Spirit had covenanted in eternity in order to save sinners like you and I. And on that occasion Jesus uttered those famous words that are repeated so often at funerals. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? He, that was the question put to the people assembled at the graveside of Lazarus 2,000 years ago. But what about us today? Do we believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? In Gethsemane, on the night he was betrayed, he prayed again to his Father. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they may know you. There is a great deal of difference between knowing somebody in a superficial way and knowing them in a knowing and intimate way, knowing him personally. We might know all about Jesus. We might be able to be real of all sorts of facts about Jesus. But do we know him as our Savior? Do we know him as a lover of our soul? A mere acquaintance with Jesus will never get us in uh, to heaven. But knowing him personally as our Savior and Lord, we will find the door of heaven wide open and there will be a welcome there, the same kind of welcome that the father gave to the prodigal son when he realized the futility of the life that he had led and when he came back to his father seeking forgiveness for his sins. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed for his disciples. Holy Father, he said, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. And then he said, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples that is. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So 2,000 years ago, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was not only praying for his disciples, those who were around him on that occasion, but he was praying for you, and he was praying for me. He was praying for all of his people in every single age. The apostles have long since gone to glory, their tasks faithfully fulfilled, that their message prevails, and that's the message that we and you as Christians are called upon to proclaim, to share uh, with uh, others. And so here Jesus he, he dismissed the crowds, he had heard the, uh, the sad news of the beheading of his cousin and John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus would have been sad at heart. And uh, he had gone uh, to a solitary place. But the crowds saw him. They heard that he was in the locality. And so they came surging 
uh, around him. We read in verse 21, that those whom he fed with the bread and the fish were 5,000 men, roughly speaking, and women and children. So here was the Lord Jesus wanting some private time, wanting space, wanting to be alone with his Father. And yet the people came. And he would have been uh, within his rights to have told them to go away and come back on a further occasion. But Jesus was not like that because we read here that he had compassion upon uh, the crowd. He had compassion on them and he healed their sick. And then once he had fed them, he dismissed the crowd and uh, he told his disciples to get into the boat and to cross over to the other side of the lake. And only then was Jesus able to engage in prayer. He went up on a mountainside by himself uh, to uh, pray. And while he was praying, the disciples were rowing their way uh, across the Sea of Galilee, across the Sea of uh, Tiberias. It's not a huge sea, it's a lot smaller than many of our uh, great lochs here in Scotland, but a storm uh, blew up and we find that the disciples were battling against the elements. They were straining at the oars and uh, there is no doubt that Jesus from his high vantage point uh, could see them in the distance. He was aware of uh, their anxiety, he was aware of their fears, that although they were experienced fishermen, Yet, if left to themselves, they probably would not have gone out to sea on that occasion. They would have awaited uh, for the wind to die down and for the waves to become uh, smaller. And Jesus had commanded them to go, and so uh, they went. In Mark chapter 6, we read, he saw the disciples straining at the oars. And at that particular moment, the disciples were in the midst of a fearsome trial. They were battling the wind and the waves and they were getting nowhere. I've been out fishing on lochs sometimes in a small boat and the wind has blown up and I didn't have an outboard motor and uh, I had a real struggle just to row against a headwind in order to get the boat back to the jetty from where I had picked it up. And this was something far, far a greater. And these were experienced fishermen. These were men who were accustomed to the sea. They were straining at the oars, we read in chapter 6 of Mark's account. And the Greek word that is a translated straining, at the straining at the oars, it's a, a word that speaks of torture or of torment. The disciples were tormented, as it were, in their efforts to drive the boat forward. Their arms and their backs would have been aching. And Matthew here uses the same word, but he uses it of uh, the boat. The boat was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. The boat would have been going up and down wildly. It would have been creaking. It would have been rolling from side to side. And the same Greek word is used by Matthew. The boat was, as it were, in a torment. And meanwhile, what was Jesus doing? Was he simply up there on the mountainside praying? Was he uh, looking on and yet he was doing nothing about the situation? Was he anxious but felt that he was unable to help? Well, we know that on a previous occasion Jesus had calmed uh, a great storm from within a boat in the midst of that storm. And here Jesus could have calmed the storm that his disciples were going through on that occasion. He wouldn't have had to go down to the sea itself. He could have calmed the storm from his hilltop vantage point, just as he done, had done on an earlier occasion. But Jesus was engaged in prayer, and I'm sure that in his prayer on that occasion, he was upholding his disciples through the difficulties that they were going in. It was Jesus himself who had commanded his disciples to get into the boat and to grow across the lake. And Jesus knew that a storm would come up. You see, the disciples had to learn to trust Jesus even when he was not with them eh, physically. 
They had to learn to trust him, especially in the midst of turmoil, when they felt their resources were failing and their strength was uh, ebbing. After the Last Supper, when Jesus was surrounded by his disciples on that occasion, he said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And just as Jesus prayed for Simon on that occasion, we know that Jesus prays for all of his people all of the time. In Hebrews 7, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. When we remember, we pray for certain people in certain a situation but Jesus doesn't pray for us simply when he remembers us but we're told that Jesus prays for his people all of the time. He ever lives to intercede for his people. I don't know about you but every so often a face comes to mind of somebody that I haven't thought of, I haven't met for many, many decades. People uh, whom I hadn't thought of perhaps for 40 or 50 years and uh, I used to wonder why on earth uh, has that person suddenly come to mind at this particular moment but I came to realize that God was bringing these people to me to pray for them because it might be that friends that I knew when I was a teenager or in my early years maybe they don't have any Christian friends maybe they're going through a difficult situation maybe they were on their deathbeds maybe they were facing all sorts of trouble and I believe the Lord wants me to pray for them and it happens virtually every week this is come to me from the distant past and if you experience the same thing don't just put these people out of your mind and say oh yes I remember that person on such and such occasion but bring them before the Lord plead with the Lord for them if you don't know what the situation is that they're going through that the Lord knows and isn't it amazing that the Lord wants us to pray for these people even though he doesn't need our prayers even though the Lord will do whatever he wants to do yet he desires the prayers of his people well Satan might try to sift us as wheat just as he tried to sift Peter as wheat but the prayers of the Lord have pulled us through our trials and through our temptations he prayed for us on the night of his betrayal, and he prays for us still. If God is for us, who can be against us? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, and is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us, we read in Paul's letter to the Romans. And so Jesus eventually went out to them, walking on the water. A Lord of creation and control of the very elements that he himself had created. When the ancient Egyptians they wanted to describe something, it was absolutely impossible. They would liken it to somebody walking on water. But as we know from Luke 18, what is impossible with man or woman is highly possible with God. There is nothing that is not out with his control. And so from this passage of scripture, what does the Holy Spirit want us to take away from this particular account? And does he want us, does he want it to demonstrate Christ's power and mastery over the natural elements? Well, partly that. The Spirit wants us to, to know that Jesus is none other than God, the second person of the Trinity, that he is the Son of God, he is the creator and he is a sustainer, and that he is sovereign in all things. But when the disciples saw Jesus and were terrified, Jesus said, take courage with his eye, don't be afraid. And the Greek translation of it is I is simply I am, and that's the name by which God revealed his identity to Moses at the burning bush, simply I am. I am who I am. If you or I said to somebody, I am, it wouldn't make sense. They would be hanging on, waiting for us to finish the sentence. 
I am Donald Morrison. I am uh, the son of Angus and Medina Morrison. I am a minister in retirement. That would all make sense. But only God can simply say, I am, and leave it at that. He doesn't have to qualify the statement. He doesn't have to give any further explanation. I am. As we know that in the Bible, he reveals so much of himself. I am the creator. I am the sustainer. I am the redeemer. I am the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the one who is in total control of all that will come to pass. I am sovereign even in the age of pandemic. And sometimes when I look at the moral decline of our nation, how we have allowed a small self-centered groups of people to wield such an influence in our nation and in our schools, it is out of all proportion to their numbers. I say to myself, it is not a pandemic that we deserve as a nation, but it is to be treated as Sodom and Gomorrah, to have fire and brimstone hurled down upon us. And I believe that the pandemic will continue until we as a nation to call out to God to forgive us for our sins, to forgive us for turning away from His Word, to forgive us for, for turning away from the narrow path and following in the footsteps of Jesus. And I ask, often ask God in my prayers to come and purge us as a nation, to refine us as a nation, to purify us as a nation, because that is what we need, to draw us back from the brink of eternal destruction. And so here with the disciples going through a time of great testing and a time of great difficulty, and they were very fearful. And Jesus came alongside them and he said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And I think what God wants us to take from this passage is that we ourselves often go through trials and temptations. We often grow go through times when we are extremely fearful, we feel alone, and uh, we feel that the Lord has deserted us. But that is not the case. We have the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake us. And it's at times when we are at our lowest end and that Jesus comes alongside us and he gives us those words, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. The ancient Israelites lived beside the Mediterranean Sea, but they were not a seafaring people. And the sea always held a certain terror for them. Their neighbors further up the coast, the Phoenicians, were a seagoing people. And Solomon employed the ships of Tyre, a Phoenician city, for his trading. And Jesus came and he calmed the raging sea on this occasion, just as he had calmed the raging sea on a previous occasion when the disciples fell on their knees and said, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And there is no situation in your life or my life where Jesus cannot come and bring peace because that's who he is. He is the Prince of Peace. And as a church, the Lord will often send us out on our own. He will send us out to do battle with the evil one. He will send us out to places uh, where we might get a very rough reception. And every year we read of Christians in different parts of the world simply being slaughtered because they are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and they will not bend the knee to a false god and a false prophet. And it's in situations like that and that we need to hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. And the greatest turmoil and the greatest fear might be in our own hearts. And it's there that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will come and reign should we submit to him by faith. He walks with us. His hand will steady us when we stumble. And let us not fear the sea around us, but let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We live in an age of secular humanism. We live in an age of militant Islam. We live in an age where there is much bitter opposition to the preaching 
of the gospel. We live in an age of moral confusion where the tide of righteousness seems to have gone so far out that we live under the watchful eye of the sovereign Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are on the side of Jesus and we are on the winning side. If God be for us, and who can be against us? Jesus watches our every effort. Jesus upholds us on a daily basis in his prayers. He prays that we would be protected, that we would be strengthened, that we would be encouraged and upheld. And he doesn't just watch us from some distant vantage point. When he sees our strength ebbing, he comes alongside us by his Holy Spirit and he gives us those words, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And these are not mere words said for our encouragement, but they are words accompanied by the person and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us be confident in this, that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And may we know individually and corporately the prayers of the Lord Jesus upholding us in all that we can seek to do in his name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen. And the Lord bless to us his thoughts and meditations on his word. We thank you, eternal God, for this passage of scripture. We thank you that Jesus came down from the mountain top and he came and walked alongside the disciples and, and encouraged them and so that they came to realize that this was truly the Son of God. And there is no situation into which the Lord Jesus Christ cannot enter in and to give us his peace, that peace that passes all understanding. May your people throughout the world, and especially those who are in dangerous and challenging situations, may they know that peace, may they know themselves to be upheld by the prayers of the eternal Son of God, the one whom Paul said he loved me and gave himself for me. Take away anything said this morning that's not in accordance with your word, May the glory be yours, and may the blessings be ours, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We conclude by singing in uh, Mission Praise, um, sorry, Mission Praise, 770, will your anchor hold in the storms of life. When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, when your anchor drift or firm remain, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. We stand to sing for your anchor hold in the storms of life.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, one God, rest and remain with you all.